Okay, so let's get started. So forget all of this. And I'll try to see that there. Okay, good. Ah. Um, so last time, let's recall what we did last time. We, uh, we basically proved the Riemann mapping theorem. Modulo, it's always modulo something. Riemann mapping theorem. Um, we took some arbitrary region U. We don't, we don't know what it is. All we know is that it, it's missing a point. I'm just reminding you the proof. It's, it's missing a point, therefore we can create a logarithm. And we used that logarithm to move, uh, to move, well, any, any fixed point W to some G of W. But we needed this alpha to make the logarithm. Um, and then we, sh we show that G of W plus two pi i actually has a ball around it with no, so that the image under this map, initially, you see, this could have just been a slit plane to begin with. There's no ball in a neighborhood. Uh, the, the, the assumptions of the theorem are just that U is, uh, is simply connected, simply connected and proper. So there does not need to be an entire ball missing from an entire ball in U complement. So the first device is to get a ball in U complement. So this is get a ball in U complement or the image of U complement under something. Once we have a ball, then we can invert in that ball, invert in that ball, invert in the ball and get U to be inside the disk. So it's very easy as a first step to get U to be a bounded region and hence by translation and rescaling, we can get U inside the unit disk and to contain the origin. Step two is what we have to justify. Step two, so this was step one, uh, get into disk, get inside the disk. Step two, is we had this space of functions from, now I'm replacing, now this is my U, from U to the disk, uh, which are injective, holomorphic, and take zero to zero. We looked at the supremum over all such functions of their derivative at zero. We showed that this is bounded and it's at least one because the, uh, this is a non-empty family, the identity function satisfies the, the conditions. And we claimed, claimed, this is what needs to be justified, that there exists an F in F such that, that realizes this maximum, the supremum. And then step three, we showed that this F is not only injective, but is surjective and hence bijective and holomorphic and, and hence uh, conformal. Biholomorphic. Okay. Should we remember how step three went or you're happy with that? You can, you can review the, the video, right? Okay, so this is the thing that we need to justify today. This claim, this claim that there, there exists such an F. All right, and we stated, I think we stated Montel's theorem. Any questions so far? So far, so good. We stated Montel's theorem. So let's give a couple of definitions first. So a family, this is a family of functions. For us, they'll be holomorphic, but the, the, these definitions are more general. This is just a family of functions on some domain, uh, well, with some range, is um, uniformly bounded on compacta. If for every compact subset of U, there exists a bound 
so that for every point in that compact subset and for every function in the family, f of z is bounded. Okay, uniformly bounded on compacted. This is definition one. Definition two, f is equicontinuous. Equi, that's a q, that's an i, and that's an o, that's a c. Should I just write the word again? I'm not sure I'm making it any better. Equicontinuous um, on compacta. If for every compact subset and for every epsilon, there exists a delta. So this is uniform continuity, uniform in the family. There exists a delta so that um, for all z and w in the compact set and for all functions in the family, if z minus w is within delta, then f of z minus f of w is within epsilon. So this is continuity. It's uniform over all points in a compact set for any fixed compact set and for all functions in the family. Okay, equicontinuity. And finally, uh, a family is normal. F is normal if for every sequence fj in f, there exists a subsequence um, fnj, uh, which converges, converges uniformly on compacta. Okay, so again, uniform convergence, uh, it converges. So um, if you give me an epsilon, I have to give you, it's like in the sense of Cauchy sequences, I have to give you an N so that as long as NJ and MJ are larger, let me, let me write this out. Uh, given epsilon, so on compacta, so you so for all compact subsets, for all compact subsets of U, and for all epsilon, there exists an n so that for all uh, nj, nj prime greater than n, and for all uh, z in the compact set, f of nj of z minus f of n, f sub and j prime of z is less than epsilon. Okay, so uniform convergence converges uniformly on compacta. Uniform convergence is that uh, as long as you make the indices large enough, every single point will be uh, will, will be Cauchy. Okay, independent of where the point is in the compact set, but you restrict to your favorite compact set. Isn't this uniformly Cauchy and not uniformly convergent? Um, since the, so convergence is equivalent to Cauchy because okay. uh, C is a complete field. Yeah. And so Montel's theorem, Montel's theorem is that if so this was just a general state. This is just de general definitions of families of things. Um, F is family of holomorphic functions that are uniformly bounded on compacta implies equicontinuous. On compacta, and this is this is only over the complexes, and then the two together, this and this together implies normal, and this is uh, this last thing is often called Arzella Ascoli, Arzella 
Scully, and it's something that, that has nothing to do with the complexes. But this really is over the complexes. So just for another family of uh, examples, we saw one last time, if we look at the functions x to the n on 0, 1, for any compact subset, well, they look like here's x to the 1, and x to the 2, and x to the 3, and x to the 4, and so on. Uh, you will never get equicontinuity. These are not, this family is not, of course, it's uniformly bounded. It's bounded between 0 and 1, not even on compact. It's just uniformly bounded. But it's not equicontinuous. Uh, uniformly bounded, check, but not equicontinuous because uh, Fn of 1 minus Fn, Fn of any other point, uh, x0, well, this goes to 1. Any other point x0, the limit in as n as n goes to infinity. The limit as n goes to infinity, this goes to zero, and this stays at one. Okay, so not it's not it's not even continuous. The limit isn't continuous. Not only is it not equicontinuous. Okay, let's begin the proof. Any questions on the statement? Any questions on? Is there anything else I wanted to say? Okay, so we're assuming that we are uniformly bounded on compacta. We have to prove equicontinuity on compacta. So on compacta, proof, assume uniform bounded on all compacta, and now want equicontinuous on compacta. So if, if we want equicontinuity on compacta, so we're given some compact subset of U. OK, again, uniform continuity. We're given this, and we're given epsilon. Is Brandon here? This is the intros tactic in Lean. And given, given epsilon positive. Anybody know about the Lean theorem prover, interactive theorem prover? Anyway, so um, what are we going to do? All we know about the sequence is that it's uniformly bounded uh, on any compacta. So um, we're trying to get to a statement like this. The hint is that we're going to use complex analysis. And there's something very powerful that we have in complex analysis, namely the Cauchy integral formula. So let's try to get the Cauchy integral formula and in, integral representation involved. So. So here's u. I don't know what u looks like, but inside of u, I have this compact set k. k is compact. So there's some uh, r. So there exists r such that the distance of a compact set to a closed set, u complement, is, uh, is positive. We don't need to review this theorem. This is point set topology. You guys are okay with this. Okay. So we have some positive distance to the complement of u. What I want to do is um, take any two points, let z and w be in, um, let's take them in k. We're going to come up with a delta. We need z and w to be in k. We're going to come up with a delta so that if, as long as they're close enough, we have this, this control on, on f. OK? Um, f of z minus f of w. So here's z. I don't know where they are. Maybe they're getting near the boundary. Maybe, maybe that's what I'm worried about, z and w f of z minus z f of w, I can express as an integral 1 over 2 pi i. Uh, let me explain what, what region we'll take in a second. Um, f of zeta times 1 over zeta minus z minus 1 over zeta minus w d zeta. So I'm just using the integral representation, or if you like, I'm using the, uh, the residue theorem. f is a nice. F, our function f, yeah, so we're given 
given f in f, f is holomorphic on all of u. So what I want is a disk that will uh, be entirely contained in u so that I'm only integrating over u. So let's take a disk of radius. Let's take a, uh, the boundary of the disk of radius r over 2 around, it doesn't matter which one you take, let's say z. Does everybody see that? So as long as, let's say, z minus w is less than, I don't know, r over 4. So that this disk of radius r over 2 captures both of them inside. So this distance, um, this distance is less than r over 4, but this distance is r over 2. This radius, maybe I need another color, this radius is r over 2. So far, so good. OK. Now, f is uniformly bounded on compacta. But we might be leaving the original compact set. It doesn't matter. It's uniformly bounded on all compacta. So uh, note, note that the set of all, uh, let's call it k prime, k prime is the um, union of all disks, closed disks of radius r over 2 about z in the compact set k. This is still compact. It's still compact. Uh, why? It seems like I'm, uh, so each of these disks is closed. It's certainly bounded. But now I'm taking an arbitrary union of closed things. That's not necessarily closed. Why is it still compact? Okay, you guys want to think about it. Let me let you let me uh, let me leave this as an exercise. We have a cover of K, so um, not. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Well, it's a closed no. cover that complicates it. That's right. Um, I would take the closure of k prime and show that it equals k prime. Is my first thought, but I might be wrong. Like, you can take in fact, the open isn't... cover corresponding to the closed disk. Yeah, yeah, that has the final. In final fact, uh, it 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 causes us no harm to to take the closure anyway. And then it's really obviously compact. Then it's really obviously compact. But it really doesn't matter. So let's not uh, let me not uh, exp expend your brain power on on this exercise. Just take the closure. This is a compact set. It's a, it's certainly a subset of you because we're staying uh, uh, we're closing things up on a ball of radius r over two. But the distance to the uh, complement of you is distance r away from every point of k. Can you like expand a finite each set in a finite cover of k by a certain amount, like thicken it by essentially taking the union of balls around each point in a single element of the open cover, and then use that as an open cover for- You could, you could. It doesn't really matter. All I wanna do is give myself a compact set that contains all of the points that we're integrating over. That's all I really care about. So I have this slightly bigger compact set K prime, and I'm bounded uniformly on compacta, including on this compact set. So there exists a B such that for all Z and for all Z, I guess I should call it for all zeta in K prime, F of zeta is bounded by B. So far, so good. So I don't need this exercise anymore. Actually, it's good because I want to clear some room. So now let's look at this. Let's look at the absolute value here. 
I can pull out the worst value of f of zeta. Every point in this uh, boundary of a disk of radius r over 2 is contained in k prime. And so f of z, this is bounded by b. I have this 1 over 2 pi. Doesn't matter. What can we say about this? This is equal to uh, zeta minus w minus zeta minus z over zeta minus w uh, zeta minus z times. Z I'm just combining the, de the denominators. The zetas cancel out on top and bottom. Hello. There we go. Uh, sorry, on, on the, the two zetas on top cancel out. And so I get a z minus w. Let's pull that out. That doesn't have anything to do with, with uh, zeta. In the denominator, what is the absolute value of this? So let's put absolute values. Absolute value. What's the absolute value of zeta minus z? R over 2. It's exactly r over 2, because we're integrating over this ball of radius exactly r over 2. So zeta, zeta ranges over the ball that's exactly a distance r over 2 away from z. How about zeta minus w? How close could zeta possibly get to w, assuming w is within r over 4 of z? Let me blow up this picture a little bit. I have z and w. These are a distance r over 4 apart. And then I have a distance r over 2 ball. This is r over 4. What's the closest zeta and w could possibly get to each other? r over 4. Thank you. OK. You all know it, but, you, but you're too shy to say. OK, so this distance is at least r over 4. So 1 over this distance is at most r over 4. So we have our inequalities the right way. So I have an r over 2 and an r over 4 from these two terms. And finally, there's the length of the interval, which is 2 pi times the radius. R is a fixed constant. B is a fixed constant. So if this is epsilon, if this is supposed to be to make this, I mean, it's obvious, right? It, it's, it's Lipschitz. Uh, to make this less than epsilon, choose uh, delta equal to uh, some constant times times this uh, exercise. Okay. The point is, it's Lipschitz. It's just some constant, some some fixed constant times z minus w. So as long as z minus w is less than r over four, so we make delta be the minimum of of this thing in r over four, then uh, then then we're done. Any questions on equicontinuity? Does this make sense? Anna, it's good. Thomas? I zoned out of it for the last statement. <laughs> okay. What's, what, what's that to make what less than epsilon? Did you follow that the, that we bounded the difference of f of z minus f of w by some constants times z minus w? Yeah, yeah, that was fine. So then we're done because okay. we're trying to make f minus f of z minus f of w small as long as z minus w is small. It's obvious. Okay. Yeah. Right. I guess because the constants are independent of the constants are fixed constants yeah. uniform over our compact set. As long as we fix a compact set to start so that we have oh, this nice. radius. But what okay. is that symbol you wrote to make what less than epsilon right at the bottom? Oh, upper arrow to make this. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was like tau. <laughs> Yeah, now it looks like a mushroom. To make to make that thing less than epsilon, choose delta to be that over some constant. 
Okay. So that showed this implication. Uniformly bounded on compacta, we just use the Cauchy integral formula. We use the boundedness of f, and then it, it just falls out. It's very easy to get this equi equicontinuity on compacta. Now we have to do our, our zella Ascoli normality. So far, so good. Okay. So now, assume our, our family F is uniformly bounded on compacta and equicontinuous on compacta, since we can assume that from part one. Uh, want, and then we want uh, that it's normal. So we want uniform convergence. We want subsequences that have uniform convergence on compacta. Okay. So we're given uh, some sequence fi in f. Um, we have some region U. U is some subset of the complex plane. Uh, here's a, a, a fun trick. So this is basically dia a diagonalization on steroids. This argument is diagonalization. And then when you've diagonalized, then you diagonalize some more. And then one more time just to be safe. Um, diagonalization requires countable things. And the nice thing about the complex plane is that it's separable. There's a dense countable subset, in fact, uh, the rational points, these are A plus B I with A and, by, A and B rationals are dense countable. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna let, let's call it W I be dense countable subset of U, dense in U, dense countable. Like U intersect uh, Q adjoin I or something. Okay, so let's look at the picture. We have U, whatever U is, I don't know, it doesn't have to be bounded. And then we have all these points, dense countable set of points, WI. Okay. Now look at FJ of W1. This is a this is a, a set of the FJs are a function on the compact set containing the singleton W1, which is certainly closed and bounded. Then these values are all bounded, uniformly bounded. And if you're uniformly bounded, so now you have, we have a bunch of complex numbers. Right, we're the, uh, the the map under F, Fn. Uh, well, we have some sequence F, Fi, Fj, Fn. I keep changing which one it is. So each Fn takes Wj to some bounded region. I don't know where. Here's F1 of W1. We're starting with W1, and here's F2 of W1. I don't care where they go, but it's a bounded region. So there's a subsequence that converges, just on that one point. There exists, this is uniformly bounded. Hence, there exists a subsequence. Let's call it Fn1, uh, which is a subsequence of Fi, such that uh, Fn1 of W1 converges. Okay, there's some subsequence where, where, there's, where there's a convergent value for, uh, for, for this subsequence. Only at W1 converges, only at this one point. I have no idea what's going on in, in the rest of the function. Okay, now look at Fn1 of W2. The singleton W2 is a compact set. These numbers are uniformly bounded. Uniformly bounded. Hence, there exists a subsequence. 
a subsequence of the subsequence, uh, let's say Fn2, subsequence of Fn1, that's a one, this is a comma, uh, where Fn2 of Fn2 uh, of W2 and, and W1 converges. And W1 automatically, since this is a subsequence of the functions where, where these things converge. Does that make sense? So we've got a subsequence now for which both two points have convergent, uh, are, are convergent. Okay, of course, we're going to continue this. So we have a subsequence F and J. So for all J, we get a subsequence F and J such on which on which um, W1 through Wj converge, uh, on which we have convergence at, convergence at, on which we have, have convergence at these finite, finitely many points. Okay, does everybody see what we're doing? So we got convergence at W1, then we got convergence at W2, then we got finitely many points until we got convergence at Wj. So there's this subsequence F and J that converges on all of the points from one to J. Diagonalization argument one, let's Gn be Fnn. then Gn converges at Wj for all J. As soon as N is bigger than J, you are, you are converging. I didn't say the convergence was uniform. No, I lost you. I see some blank stairs. I have to prove that the convergence is uniform, but modulo that, are you happy with the fact that we found a subsequence that converges on all of these countably many points that are also dense inside you? Okay. Um, so what I claim is that G will converge uh, uniformly on some compact set. So first let's fix some compact subset of U. Okay. Uh, and my claim is that GN converges uniformly on K. So far, so good. Okay, so we have some compact set K. Okay. Um, and what I want to say is, uh, let uh, so let's let's prove this uniform convergence. Let epsilon be given. And um, take the take the delta. Let delta come from the equicontinuity. We have uh, a bunch of functions. These are all in our in our family. The family is assumed to be equicontinuous. Given an epsilon, we we get back. Given an epsilon and a compact set. Given an epsilon and a compact set, we get a delta. That's what uh, equicontinuity gives us. With the property that any two points in any, uh, in any uh, as long as they're within delta such that for all Z W in K, Z minus W less than delta implies, uh, and for all functions, including the GNs, 
uh, implies g n of z minus g n of w is less than uh, epsilon, right? So we get we get this delta from equicontinuity. Um, then the union of the disks of radius delta about the wj covers k. The wj are dense. You take any ball around all the wj's, you get a cover of k. So what? Birching, you're about to say? Oh, no. Anna? You can just take finally many. I, exactly. Was, it, was that Anna? No, I didn't. No. No. <laughs> no. Uh, I can't tell who, who that was. Kailash, maybe? Yeah, Kailash. OK, good. Then. Uh, so we have an arbitrary open cover <laughs> implies there exists a finite, finite subcover. In other words, K is contained inside a finite, as J goes from one to big J, list. Well, maybe I didn't need all of them, but I'll take the ones from one to J. There's some finite list. So in other words, uh, let me make a new picture here. So this was U. K is some compact subset. We had our list of Ws. We only need finitely many of these Ws so that delta balls around these Ws cover all of K. Okay. This is true for every N. This is true for every N. As long as Z minus W can be made uh, within delta, then this difference is at most epsilon. Now, um, we have convergence at every, uh, the GN converge at WJ. What does that mean? I.e., for all epsilon, including this epsilon, there exists an NJ, depends on WJ, such that if N and M are bigger than NJ, then gn at wj minus gm at wj is at most epsilon, right? That's exactly what it means that the gns converge at wj. But now we only care about finitely many wj's. We only have finitely many wj's to worry about. So we can let big N be Yeah, Birchin, you're saying it, the max. Yes. The max of the NJs as J goes from one to J, which is a nice finite number, which it wouldn't be in general. So, now, if n and m are bigger than this n, then what can we say about uniform convergence uh, on this compact set k? So if I have, um, let's say, z minus w is less than delta, OK? If z minus w is less than delta, well, z Wherever z is, uh, let's say z and w are in k, and z minus w is less than delta. Wherever z is, it's within delta of some wj. Um, there exists a wj such that uh, z, let's see, maybe let's make this delta over 2 just to make sure that z and w are both in the delta ball of that WJ. So I have two points, let's see. Let me make these, uh, the WJs are these special red points. 
I'm just centering all of the disks at these special points. Okay, so these are the WJs. And then I have two new points, two arbitrary points, uh, Z and W. That's Z, that's W. And all I'm saying, I guess I should have chosen the other WJ. There is some WJ that contains both of both Z and W in its in its ball of radius delta. So far, so good. Okay. So what? We're trying to prove we're trying to prove the uniform convergence of the um, of this sequence. We're trying to prove this. Given a compact set and given an epsilon, there exists an n. We've just given ourselves that n. We want for any two points bigger than n, uh, and for all. Sorry, I don't need a z and a w, right? I just need a single z. I want to know that I have uniform convergence independent of of z. So actually, I don't need a z and a w. Maybe that's why you guys are confused. I don't need a z and a w. then for all z in k, there exists a wj so that z, so I don't need, I don't need the w. There's a wj that's, that's within delta of, of z. Does that make sense? Um, so if n and m are greater than n, let's look at gn of z minus gm of z. This is what I want to be less than epsilon for every z uniformly over z, just by choosing n, uh, n and m large enough. And so how are we going to do this? It's a three epsilon argument, gn of z minus gn at wj plus plus gn of wj minus gm of wj plus gm of wj minus gm. That's supposed to be an m. Whoops, not that one. This one, that is an m. OK, good, of z. OK, does everybody see that? I just added and subtracted gn of wj and gm of wj and took the triangle inequality. Now, we have equicontinuity. Equicontinuity says for any, for any points, Z and W within a ball, in a delta ball of one another, this difference is less than epsilon. So this is less than epsilon. Let's say this is less than epsilon by equicontinuity. How about this? It's the same M, GM, GM. That means it's, a, it's one function and W, J, and Z differ by delta. So this is also less than epsilon. What about this? We have convergence at W, J and N and M are larger than capital N. Capital N was the worst of the NJs and the NJs are determined by this convergence. This, this is less than epsilon since G n, the sequence converges, converges at this point W j. And when you add all three, you get less than three epsilon. Okay, we're almost there. I realize I blew right through our, I'm supposed to give you a break. I, I went right past the break. Uh, can we, I should give you a break. We have one more thing to do because um, we're not quite done. We did this for a fixed compact set and we want to know that the sequence GN, this one, we want to make one sequence GN that will converge on any compact set. We made a sequence GN and proves that it, and proved that it converges on this compact set. But we want, to, we want one GN that will converge on, on all compact sets. Let's take five minutes. Uh, that'll give us a chance to review this argument as well and um, come back slightly refreshed. I realize these, these uh, real analysis arguments 
I mean, this is why we're teaching complex and not real, because uh, real has all of these epsilons floating around and you have to get, keep track of what, uh, you know, what argument, what we're trying to prove. So that's, that's really, for me, at least the hardest thing to keep track of is what are we actually trying to prove here? So um, let's take a little break. Okay, so let's just very briefly talk about what an exhaustion is. Um, note that the set KL is the set of points Z uh, in U um, with Z bounded by L and the distance from Z to U complement being at least uh, one over L. This set is, is, once I do that, is compact. So I take U, whatever U is, KL will be the points that are distance at least one over L from U complement and are bounded. So I have to cut off at, at some L. So this is KL. Um, so let, let KL be this. The note is then uh, U is the union of these KLs. So the, the KLs are nested. And any compact set K is contained in some KL. Because if it's compact, any compact subset of U is contained in some KL. So if it's compact, well, then it's bounded. So it's bounded by some L. And if it's compact, then its distance to the complement is at least some one over F, some R. So one over R. So take L large enough, and uh, the compact set will be contained in in that KL. Okay, does that make sense? So the one final step is that uh, G N one converges converges uniformly on K one. And a subsequence GN2 converges uniformly on K2, and so on. So if we take HN to be GNN, that converges uniformly on all KLs. So that's the, the final diagonalization step, is to, to do this uh, exhaustively. But I don't like it because GN1 already, GN itself already converges uniformly on each of the, the KLs. But all right, let's, let's move, move past this. So we need uh, one more application, so proposition. If I have uh, a set U which is connected and, um, and a sequence of injective holomorphic functions and a sequence Fn of injective holomorphic functions on U such that the Fn converge uniformly on compacta, then the limit um, is either then F, which is the limit of the Fn's, is either injective or constant. Okay, this is one last thing that I, that I, one last proposition we'll need in the proof of the Riemann mapping theorem. So, um, proof, if F, this limit is not injective, is not injective, this is a simple application of, uh, well, what is it? Rawls theorem, not Rawls. Uh, um, the argument principle, basically. If F is not injective, um, there exists F of Z1, there exists Z1, Z2 in U, so that F of Z1 equals F of Z2. So you look at the functions GN defined as Fn of Z minus Fn of Z1. Uh, 
Okay, these functions, this is, a, this is just a constant and uh, that constant converges to something. These functions also converge uniformly on compacta, converge uniformly on compacta. And the FNs are injective. And so these are not zero, uh, are never zero oh, oh, except at Z zero, except at uh, Z one rather, Z equals Z one. Okay, so um, now if the limiting function, how shall I put this? So let's look at the integral of g n prime over g n of w dw, one over two pi i. This will be the number of uh, zeros or poles. There's no poles, so this is just the number of zeros, right? The number of zeros minus the number of poles, the argument principle, you guys remember this? Um, and I want to take this over a ball of radius uh, some fixed epsilon about Z2. So I have Z1, here's, here's U, wherever it is, here's Z1. This is the place where all of these GNs have a zero and I take some other point Z2. Wait, so real quick before we continue, is, are we assuming F is injective for this? I'm assuming that the limiting function is not injective. Well, this is just a side comment. If F is not injective, what does it mean to be not injective? There are two points that have the same value. So let's consider those two points. Okay, but we're, we're okay, but we know where every Fn is injective. Every Fn is injective. Right, right. Every okay. Fn is injective. Right, I, I want to okay. know that the limit is injective. And I claim I, our only options for limits of holomorphic injective functions are either that the limit is injective or the limit is just constant. Okay. So, um, so let's look at, at this, this integral. So the GNs converge uniformly on compacta and on this radius epsilon ball, on this radius epsilon ball. So if F is non-constant, um, how do I want to say this? The, the uh, G ends converge to G and G of course is F of G of Z is F of Z minus F of Z one. And if F is non-constant, F is non-constant implies uh, there exists, it implies that uh, if, if Z two is another zero, then it's an isolated zero. If Z2 is a zero of G, then it is isolated, which means I can take some epsilon ball. So G uh, does not equal zero on the boundary of a ball of radius epsilon about Z2. So I'm allowed to form this integral. Does that make sense? Um, if I can form this integral and the GNs are non-zero, G is the limiting G is non-zero. Well, by uniform convergence on compacta, this boundary, this circle is compact. And so these things are one over G, one over GN is also non-zero on this, this uh, boundary by uniform continuity by uniform uh, convergence on compacta, on, on the compact set, which is this ball, the GNs for n large enough, n uh, large enough, this is non-zero. So I can make sense of all of these and these converge. So one over GN converges uniformly to one over G. G prime converges, G prime n converges uniformly on compacta to GN. G prime n, G prime uniformly on compacta. So this converges 
to one over two pi i integral over the same boundary of g prime of w over g of w dw. Each of these is, is asking how many zeros there are, but each of the gn's is still in injective. I've just subtracted off a constant, right? So each of these is still injective. Uh, anyway, it doesn't vanish. So these are all zero. But if f is non-constant and it has a, a, a second zero, then this is supposed to be one. And that's the contradiction. All right, I rushed that argument a little bit because I'm out of time and I, I, I do want to finish the, um, the Riemann mapping theorem. So hopefully you can go over that and just think about it a little bit and, and it'll make sense. But does it sort of roughly make sense what's going on? So if it's injective, then uh, the limit also has to be injective unless it's constant. Okay, if it's constant, then, then there's nothing to do. Why does this proposition and Montel together allow us to finish the Riemann mapping theorem? Let's just uh, spend one minute to finish things so we don't so we can start a new topic on Friday. Ah, I want to tell you about the Dirichlet problem and I want to tell you about the explicit Riemann mapping theorem. Fine, maybe we'll spend five minutes on Friday on um, on those things. So why do we get our f? So all the way back back to our family f of functions from this subset of the disk to the disk, which are injective and holomorphic and send zero to zero. And we had S be the supremum of the derivatives at zero. We show that this was finite. We show that it's at least one. Okay, if it's the supremum, let Fn be a sequence in F with the derivative in absolute value going to s, right? That's what it means to be a supremum. It means there's, there's a limit. By Montel, this fn has a subsequence. fn has a subsequence, which is normal, which is normal, converges uniformly on compacta, converges uniformly on compacta. By the previous proposition, by the proposition, we have a limiting function. Uh, limit f and j is f. This function, limit of holomorphic functions uh, that converge uniformly on compacta is holomorphic that we proved long, long ago. It's holomorphic. It's either injective or it's constant. Can it be constant? Its derivative at zero is bigger than one. Non-constant, hence injective. Non-constant, S, so F prime of zero is bigger than one, hence injective. So it is holomorphic, it is injective, and just by continuity, uh, all of the functions have take zero to zero, uh, F of zero equals zero. Why does it map to the disk? We might have, we know by continuity, by continuity, that f, this limiting function, all of the uh, functions take values in the disk. So the limiting function also takes values in the closure of the disk. But I don't want it to take values in the closure of the disk. I want it to take values in the disk itself. Open mapping term. Uh, either open mapping theorem or maximum modulus. Yeah, which is uh, basically the same thing. But uh, by maximum modulus, we can't have uh, interior points taking an absolute value the, the, same, the same as the as the boundary. By maximum modulus, f of z is strictly less than 1 for all z in u, since it's non-constant already. And that is everything we need to know that F is in the family. So we indeed have a member of this family that realizes the optimal supremum. So all of that work was to get, was to go from uh, uniform bounded, the boundedness is that we're on the disk, we're uniformly bounded on compacta implies equicontinuity, equicontinuity implies normality 
And then we have this extra last proposition. Normality implies injectivity. If, if you have a limit of injective functions that converges uh, uniformly on compacta, which is what we get from being normal, then uh, the limiting function is either injective or, or constant. That's the Riemann mapping theorem. I mean, th today wasn't any of the fun stuff. It was all the uh, functional analysis type. It's not even functional analysis. It's just real analysis type arguments. But um, I'll make two remarks on it that I think are important. I want to explain how you solve the Dirichlet problem. Uh, just a hint at it. And I want to show you this really cool thing with the uh, explicit Riemann mapping theorem, because this is not explicit, right? It doesn't tell you how to find such a function. It's a beautiful story. Um, Maybe we'll spend just a little bit more time on this, and then we go back to chapter five and do Weierstrass uh, um, function theory, followed by the Riemann zeta function and the prime number theorem. Hopefully, we'll have time for uh, elliptic curves and, and functions, but we'll see. OK, very good. See you on uh, today is indeed Tuesday, so see you on Friday. <laughs>